Um, so something I wanted to bring up is obviously the the new Brad Schoenfeld study that came out. Mm. A lot of people have been talking about. They did it was like one set for the body parts um, three times a week versus I don't remember the exact breakdown. You, I'm sure you know better than I do. But the total volume I think for lower body was nine, twenty seven, and forty five sets, right? Yeah. Um, and then and what was it for upper? I know thirty was the max they did. Yeah, I think it was uh, like six something and thirty. Yeah, it's somewhere right in the right around there. Yeah, yeah. It, but it was uh, thirty to forty-five in the high end. I think eighteen to twenty-seven, and then like mm -hmm. six to nine yeah. in the uh, low. And, yeah. and then they found that the highest volume saw the the greatest hypertrophy. Which you know we do see that volume is one of the greatest drivers of hypertrophy. But I think a lot of people were surprised to see it to that extent, or mm -hmm. forty-five sets for lower body. Do you find that that's kind of true in your experience? Because obviously the studies are important, but you know, I mean, you can cut, find countless examples when talking to people online or training where you cut back their volume and they seem to do better and they weren't necessarily doing an insane amount of volume. Like I see people go from training arms 12 to 15 sets, you know, I mean, a, a decently high amount to six sets and they start growing again. And, mm -hmm. and so I think every study we see, it just keeps saying volume is good, volume is good. Just on the whole, I mean, what do you think about the new study's results and how that should be applied? Well, I think there's a few ways to look at this. One is that the way we think about counting volume as practitioners is typically different from the way it is done for meta-analyses and the way it was done in this study and in most studies, in that whether you're doing a bench press, an overhead press, or a tricep extension, we count those as a one-to-one -one for triceps, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about you know quad volume, whether that's a leg extension, a squat, or a leg press, we count it all equally in, in a study. So I think this gives a slightly inflated view of how much volume is actually happening. Like so, like you said, the high-end volume group was doing 30 sets for the upper body, um, and you know one of the, the metrics measured was biceps thickness, right? So if we think about what is a, a how do we get 30 sets of biceps? You know that could be four sets of lat pull downs, four sets of rows, and then two bicep exercises for 34 sets each, twice per week. And no one would go, oh, my God, hold the phone. That's crazy right. volume. How dare you do four sets of, uh, of, of, of four exercises twice per week? Um, and, but but that's, that's what was done to achieve some, some of those volumes. It, it isn't um, as mind-bogglingly as insane as it, it may sound when you hear, yeah, just do 45 sets for muscle group. And you're like, what? Right. You know? Right. <laughs> um, Knowing that, that every compound movement is counted for each one of the included muscles, I think, changes the picture a little bit. I would also say that this is one of the first studies we have where the, the participants are actually quite well trained. Mm -hmm. um, like you brought up the German volume training studies, and if you look at the volume in those, essentially 9 to 18 sets per muscle group outperformed uh, twice that. And right. these were individuals who were barely benching body weight. Mm. males. Um, so they were basically novices, uh, is, is a good way to put that. Um, and yeah, if you're a novice, doing that many sets is, is not only unnecessary, but it's pro probably well past your work capacity and recuperative capacity. Sure. And that's been shown actually a number of times. Um, there is a number of studies that show a lower threshold for, for volume. Uh, there's uh, Gonzales Padillo back in 2005 had a junior weightlifter, so we're talking like 15 to 18 year olds who trained one to three years, uh, and the moderate volume group uh, made better strength gains than the low or the high. Um, and uh, there's additional studies like that as well. There's one that just came out, um, I think it's pronounced Hazelgrave, I could be wrong. They're looking at uh, specific isolated bicep work, yeah, but among people who are doing other training, they're allowed to do other training besides biceps, and they found that the, uh, the 18 set group had a trend towards making better hypertrophy than the group that was doing, I think, closer to 27 or 30. Um, and that's not the only one. I, I, I could do a few others. The, um, there's a study by Ostrowski uh, where if you count the volume the same way Schoenfeld did, um, you see a peak in quadriceps growth around 12 sets and then a peak in triceps growth around uh, 14 sets. And then it even when you greatly increase it from 14, it's like a 0.1% increase in percentage right. change and no significant differences. So, uh, and he also each one of these studies, they're less trained. Um, so the, the take home is that there is a kind of bell curve to the volume response that as you add sets, you are going to see a, 
um, a dose response, not a linear dose response necessarily, but actually a diminishing return. You, as you invest more, you get something back with less and less and less and less. And then eventually you're investing without any additional return on investment, which is just basically you know, fatigue and additional chance to get hurt with no benefit. And then if you keep going, then you're actually starting growing, growing slower. And as we saw in those German volume training studies, if you take it so far, you actually won't even see a pre versus post change where you're, you're just you know, improving your work capacity, if anything. So, um, so that is, is kind of the big take home. I would also say that while people are suggesting that volume is a primary driver of growth, I think it shouldn't be forgotten that volume is essentially the dosage of what is actually making growth happen, which is tension. So you're supplying tension, and I've heard a lot of people kind of go, well, what's more important, tension or volume? And I think that's a really misguided way of looking at it. I think volume is, is, is saying how much tension you're applying. It's right, what right. dose of the stimulus. Um, and so, so I guess the take home for the, the Schoenfeld study is that, uh, and there's some other interesting aspects of it. Uh, James Krieger has talked about, which I think is going to be in a different paper, so I don't want to go into it in too much depth, that the, the higher the volume was, the fewer non-responders there were. So that gives us some information as a practitioner uh, that much like aerobic training, because we've seen this as far as enhancing VO2 max, it may be that the quote-unquote non-responders just simply have to do more to get a response, which is unfortunate. Um, right. Now, as far as the practical side of it, I think volume, even though it is, it has this clear effect, it should probably be the last thing you change um, when, when you're confronted with a lack of progress. I think assessing recovery, sleep, nutrition, uh, technical form, uh, adequate intensity, uh, and having someone to objectively help you do that should all be done before you decide to pile on more. Because if any one of those is, is out of whack, adding more volume is actually going to be harmful, not beneficial. Like if you're sleeping five hours a night and you decide to pile on a bunch of volume, you just decide to dig an even deeper recovery hole. If your technique is garbage and you decide to pile on a bunch more volume, you're looking at increasing your chances of injury. Uh, if your intensity is trash, you're just spending a lot of time wasting your time uh, when you could make the quality of work a lot higher. Like if you're chronically training at like a four to five RPE, mm -hmm. um, just simply taking the current volume you're doing and getting that up to like a even a six to eight RPE, you might see a, a much greater return on investment. So I think um, you have to look at these results in context of uh, what we know is the, the, the actual driver of hypertrophy, not just looking at changes in dosages to make sure you get it right, how they actually count volume, uh, understand the population that was studied and how that's different than 90% of the studies that are out there. Right. Um, and then also think about the time frame of the study. It was an eight-week study. This isn't saying, hey, we looked at these people, people doing 45 sets for muscle group for two years. Right. Um, it may very well be that they would run into a tortoise versus the hare scenario where they're achieving more injuries or experiencing more psychological burnout and that the moderate volume group passes them up. Um, right. So Especially with, I, I think, each of the, uh, I believe each of the trainees, they mentioned the sets were to failure pretty much. I mean, at least like yeah. one short of failure. So, I mean, that, especially because a lot of times it'll be, I, at least with traditional German volume trading, it's the same sets, I mean, same sets, reps, and, you know, so you're not going to failure until the very end, whereas this mm -hmm. was every one, and then they adjusted the weight so that you could stay in that rep range. But... But, I mean, that's certainly a huge stimulus. I wouldn't be surprised to see if there maybe was some, some of that drop-off there later. Yeah, uh, from, from what Schoenfeld said, in, and this is an eight-week study, so it doesn't tell us a lot, that there, uh, there weren't any injuries in the high-volume group. Um, but I think what's – but eight weeks is, is, is a time period where we've seen repeatedly studied, like, you know, the six- to 12-week study is 90% of exercise science. Mm -hmm. And I think most people can get through crazy levels of, of work at a high intensity for six to 12 weeks. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily sustainable for multiple mesocycles or, or, or like half a macro cycle even. So, yeah, you really have to think about the long term. Um, and, you know, to, to their credit, like, you know, James Krieger, he presented some of this data at the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference, which was a big conference we had in Melbourne back in July. And he was talking about this and he said, look, the only real, really feasible way if you do need to do these level of, uh, this level of volume to progress is to do it in specialization cycles to where, mm -hmm. since we know that all groups grew, that's a really important thing. It wasn't like only the high volume group grew. Right. Um, 
and that to maintain you can do even less volume, uh, you should take you know 80% of your muscle groups and then put them on like essentially maintenance or, or low-ish volume, but maybe still enough to make some kind of progress, and then really jack the volume up on one to two body parts, and then do that in a cyclical fashion uh, to kind of avoid that burn that burnout, that injury, and to make kind of quote unquote recuperative uh, energy available to, to focus on one or two muscle groups that are really getting pounded. So I think. Yeah. How you interpret the results is, is very important and uh, could easily be be misguided. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's definitely in theory. I think that's a, a great point. I, I wonder how that would work out in practice because I've heard people say that you know, once you get to the more advanced level, specialize in certain areas, and then maintain the others. I, in my experience, um, when I've tried to specialize, or I did like an arm phase or you know back phase or whatever, I do see an increase in growth and strength in those areas. Um, I don't know if I would say over the long haul it's netted me. Anything I know, like when I was doing a back specialization, I was able to do somewhere between 30 and 35 pull-ups, and I was doing 100 for a few reps, and I was pretty happy with the progress. But once I went back to my regular volume, it, it seemed to kind of cut back as well. I know in theory you can maintain with lower volume, but uh, well, not in theory. I mean, it's studied too, but uh, it, it did seem to kind of reset a little bit with my training. I don't know if you've ever seen that for you. I've, so I've experienced the same thing. I, I'm actually thinking when I got to my peak in pull-ups, I was doing not nearly that many. I got like 21. And right mm -hmm. now, I'd probably be able to get like 16 or 17. Yeah. Like, However, before I did the specialization cycle and did a ton of pull-ups all the time, it would have been 12. So yeah. I think it's it's kind of one of those things. Uh, an easy way, a more objective way of doing this is if you look at like powerlifting training where it's not uncommon to specialize in one or two lifts um, you know that during that that phase of like you know frequent one RM training on the lift, you're going to have an elevated peak. Um, but so long, so yeah, your one rep max is going to go up and be the highest during the time you're really focusing on that lift, and maybe after a taper. But what you really care about is like what's your one rep minimum, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I I remember when I because this is fresh in my mind with my hip injury, I was doing. I was benching every day, every day I trained at least, which was, you know, four to six days per week. And then I went through a period where every single one of those sessions, I started with three all the way getting up to all six, started with a conservative max attempt on bench. So something between a nine to 10 RPE. And that was when I hit that 363 bench. And I can't hit a 363 now. Uh, and I randomly tried it when I was in Austin with the rest of the 3DMJ team uh, in, I guess that was December. Uh, and ended up having like a 350th bench, you know. So if you think about it, like right. before that cycle, I wasn't benching 350 though. I was right. like 330, right. 340. Sure. So yeah, you will see that the the peak in 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 quote unquote fitness, if you will, during the period where you're trying to peak it. But then so long as it doesn't fall back below baseline, you've kept something. Right. And then it's then it's kind of you stack and layer those over and over, and then you look up five years from sure. now and you go, yeah, all right, I'm progressing. All right. So, right. 